Right. Good afternoon to all and welcome to Seminar 12, Year 3 of our Maximo Seminar. We're with the volume on difficulties in sacred scripture, the responses to Thalassios by Maximus the Confessor. And today we are looking at questions 37, 38, and 39. So pages 218 through 229. Just a handful again, but but um, a line in Maximus is worth a year's pausing over. The themes today are nature and gathering and integrity and correspondence and grace. So nature, gathering, integrity, correspondence, and grace. Now, part of our effort last time was to try to recognize, try to consider how our gathering is not for its own sake. Our gathering is not for its own sake, nor is it so that a portion of things may be proved wrong. So we don't gather just to gather, nor do we gather so that part of what we gather we can deny and select something else. Our gathering is, is apophatic. It is a thing, but it is called unto more than it is. So gathering is a holy activity unto, for the sake of, our union with God. And what we gather, we offer. But our offering also is not for its own sake. And it's not even a thing, as if we have a thing and then we offer the thing and then we don't have the thing anymore. It is rather, our offering is communion. It's our own logos unto his logos. Now, the work of our gathering occurs within the horizon of Christ. Our gathering occurs within the horizon of Christ. And we've 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 seen that in the term aphorism, aphorism means that which is gathered from the horizon. So our gathering results in aphorisms, that which is gathered from the horizon. Gathering for the sake of aphorism, means that our gathering is grounded in emphasis, not in selection and negation. So our gathering is grounded in emphasis. Now, emphasis is not doubt. Emphasis means drawing near, drawing near the gift in the unique way our logos partakes or participates in his logos. Emphasis is drawing forth, drawing near the gift in the unique way our logos partakes of his logos. And so emphasis is not comparative. It is a particular response. Emphasis is not comparative, but doubts, which as we saw etymologically last time, means via the separation. Doubt is via the separation. So doubt always involves comparison and negation. Emphasis is not about comparison and negation or equation. We emphasize rather via phrasing, our phrasing, which contrary to both doubt and negation, our phrasing draws things together in terms of, or in the horizon of, beautiful harmony. So our phrasing is for the sake of beautiful harmony. Now, our phrasing becomes simple, or we could say, the phrasing of our being partakes of simplicity insofar as it is gathered unto the beautiful harmony of the Logos of Christ. So our phrasing becomes simple insofar as it partakes of the harmony of Christ. 
the phrasing of our being. It's not just verbal phrasing, it's the phrasing of our being. Partakes of simplicity insofar as it is gathered into the beautiful harmony of Christ. And in the harmony or in the horizon or in the clearing of Christ, all things become simple as one. And this is because in the, har in the harmony or the horizon or the clearing of Christ, relation is healed and division is overcome. And not overcome in terms of negated, but overcome as illusory. Division is our construction. Now, this is realized, things become simple, not via a negative schema, not because one negates another, but rather things become, uh, things become simple via apophasis. From within, with, through, and beyond our particular being, we enter into Christ, each one of us. From within, with, through, and beyond our particular being, we enter into Christ. And it's important to keep in mind that neither cataphasis nor apophasis involves negation. In other words, neither cataphasis nor apophasis partakes of dualistic thinking. Rather, cataphasis clarifies our forms. Clarifies, right? It's according to the word. It clarifies our forms, according to the logos. Apophasis clears our forms. And by that we mean that apophasis draws our forms, draws our figures into the clearing of Christ, where things become simple and relation is healed. So cataphasis clarifies our forms, our figures, and apophasis clears our forms or figures, which means draws them into the clearing of Christ. And so together, apophasis and cataphasis heal and fulfill our partaking of God's creation. Cataphasis offers who we are, and apophasis speaks to how we are called. So together they heal and fulfill our partaking of God's creation, both who we are, cataphasis, and how we are called, apophasis. And so to partake, <clears throat> excuse me. To partake of Christ's creation is to be apophatically, to be apophatically. And this is because the essence of apophasis is transformation, not negation. So we are transformed as we partake of Christ's creation. That's what it means to be apophatically. In question uh, 37, paragraph two, uh, Maximus uses the lovely phrase, God as creator and transformer. We don't have to move there now, but God as creator and transformer. And so from this, what do we learn? God creates in love and transforms unto union with him. That's what he does. He creates and he transforms. This being the case, one could say, that any sense of God's negation of creation, any sense of God's negation, rather, of creation is blasphemous. For it confuses transformation or transfiguration with negation or healing with nihilism. And and just to be just to be clear, we're not thinking positively rather than negatively. We're trying to move beyond considering those categories as normative. We're thinking in terms of form and transformation, or figure and tra transfiguration. So any sense of God's negation of creation is blasphemous. 
And since we are of God, so our being cannot partake properly of negation either. Our being cannot partake properly of negation either. It's like something not us in us, distorting our stance and our forms of relation. Rather, rather than negate, we complement each other. We seek each other's wholeness and completion. But one is never complete alone, only in relation with another. One is never complete alone, only in relation with, with another. And yet, as Maximus teaches us, that other person brings God before us, which means our completion, which is unending, which is never finished, our completion occurs within and via synergy with the divine, with God in the other person. Here, we might phrase synergy as correspondence with the divine, which we can call grace or faith. Synergy is correspondence with God, our being transformed unto God. A word for this is grace. Another word for this is faith. Last session, we, we spoke of faith as intimate, patient correspondence intimate, patient, groping, feeling. And sort of think of faith and time for a minute. To correspond with the divine draws us beyond the parameters of both chronology or chronos and kairos. To correspond with the divine draws us beyond the parameters of both chronos and kairos. Faith, or grace, means our being is patient beyond time, intimate with Christ beyond time, and at some point, partaking of and encompassing all time. So grace or faith means our being is patient beyond time, intimate with Christ beyond time, and at some point, partaking of and encompassing all time. This is, <clears throat> pardon me. This is because the horizon of faith heals our time sense, heals our sense of time. And we realize that the movements, the movements and seeming necessities of time are not finally meaningful. They do not and cannot encompass our being. The horizon of faith heals our time sense. The horizon of faith is not a place of yes and no, of then and now, of affirmation and negation. Rather, the horizon of faith is one of, <clears throat> one of joy and delight and feasting. Now, feasting, feasting is, is delight, it's, it's poesis, it's making. Feasting is creative. And so the horizon of our faith is when feasting is whether, where feasting is abundant, where, wherein reigns the mode of creation, of creating, of giving, of making, of conjoining. So the horizon of Christ is that of joyful feasting and communion. And the clearing of Christ, or the truth, the horizon, the clearing of Christ, means where all is enjoyed as being clearly of Christ, of Christ. That little phrase we circle around, of Christ. In the readings today, 
just to conclude here, in the readings today, we we read about anagogy. We consider method a little bit. Anagogy you know, literally means the, the high, lifted up, the raised learning, higher learning. But here we can think of it in terms of the apophatic movement, which seeks the of Christ in all. Anagogy seeks how all is of Christ. It doesn't mean leaving this behind and moving up here to more rarefied airs or a more special place. It means in everything, seeking the of Christ. Anagogy is a method, a method, a, a, a high, a, you know, kind of holy path. Each of our methods, all of our methods, all is for the sake of and unto Christ who creates us and transforms us. And so even all of our movements, properly speaking, ushers us into the simple light of Christ. Now, the simple light, we have to take great care with this metaphor, simple light. For all description is only healthy and whole when it is when it is um, phrased apophatically, when it's not taken to identify something or stand in for something. It has to be part of a phrase um, that is apophatic. And of Christ, this little phrase on which our being rests, in which we dwell, and to which we are called, that's what we're yearning for here to be of Christ and see, and to perceive how other things are of Christ. Now, that by way of, of, of opening things up, let's move on to the passages. These are extraordinarily rich, and, um, and we want to listen to them, we want to hear them, we want to think about them. Michael, if I could please ask you to read question 37. Uh, the whole thing, please. The question and then the response, including the scholia. And then we'll think a little bit about it and close read a little bit, and then we'll move on to the next two questions before opening it up. But Michael, please. You have to unmute Michael, sorry. Concerning St. Paul, the book of Acts says that handkerchiefs and semi-synchia were carried away from his body to those who were sick and they were cured of their diseases. Did this take place for the sake of his ministry or for those without faith? Or did these things happen insofar as the skin of Paul's body was sanctified? And if this is why he suffered no harm when he was bitten by the viper, what was the reason why the body of the saint suffered no harm from the venom of the serpent and yet was killed by a sword. I have the same question concerning the body of Alicia and what finally are semi Cynthia response. It was neither solely because of St. Paul's holiness nor solely because of the faith of those receiving the miracle that the shadow of his body worked cures through the handkerchiefs and the semi synchia. There's a scolium partly through that sentence, which I'll read. The faith of those who were in need of healing, he says, called forth the power of the spirit in the saints so that through faith the hitherto secret power might be revealed and that the faith which had been hidden might be made manifest to all but the true manner of healing is of a nature to be shown forth when the power of those who act in the spirit coincides with the spirit of those who are being acted on. Back to the main text. Instead, it was whatever divine grace out of love for mankind distributed both to him and to them, rendering St. Paul's holiness active and effective in them through their faith. Thus, again, when grace wished, Paul's body was not susceptible to suffering, not being destroyed by the venom of the snake. There's a scolia, which I'll read, scolium, which I'll read. The one, he says, who 
by the inclination of his will, purifies himself of the corruption of sin, destroys the corrupting activity of things that naturally cause corruption. For the incorruptibility of free will maintains nature's corruptibility in a state of incorruption. Because through the grace of the spirit that is in it, it providentially does not permit nature to be dominated by the opposing qualities of the snake, either because the, this is back to the text, either because the lethal quality of the snake's venom was neutralized or because the body of Paul neutralized the venom or because of some other dispensation known by God, who's the crater and transformer of these things. And when Paul fell by the sword, this was also the determination of grace, for St. Paul was not immortal by nature, even if by grace he was able to work miracles. If on the other, the one hand, he was by nature immortal, then we would be justified in seeking the reason why, contrary to nature, he fell on the sword, held to the sword. But since he remained mortal by nature, even after his sanctification, it is not necessary to seek the reason why the divine apostle passed from life, not in this manner, but in some other. For in whatever way he wishes, God, who before the ages determined the limit of each man's life in the manner most expedient for each, leads every man, whether just or unjust, toward the final end he deserves. If then the principle of nature and grace were both one and the same, and at this point in the sentence there's a scolium, which I'll read out, because the principle of nature and grace is not, he says, one and the same, there is no difficulty in understanding that some of the saints were sometimes immune to sufferings and at other times were subject to sufferings. Since we know that the miracle was because of grace, while the suffering was from nature. If then the principle of nature and grace were both one and the same, it would be cause for wonder and astonishment that what came about was according to nature, but contrary to grace, or according to grace, but contrary to nature. If, however, the principle of nature is one thing and the principle of grace is something else, then it is clear and obvious that as saints, they worked miracles on account of grace, but as men, they suffered on account of nature. For grace does not destroy the possible part of nature, neither are the principles of nature and grace in it anyway, ever confused with each other. Let us therefore accept that the grace of God, according to the dispensation of providence, works all things through the saints, both while they are alive and after their deaths, as if through its own proper instruments for the salvation of others. But it is not according to nature that the saints by grace work these miracles, for others. The same holds true for the body of Elijah. But since it is rather the spiritual meanings of the literal accounts that make glad the souls of those who love God, we say that the body is the piety of the great apostle according to which he was to some the odor of life onto life but to others, the smell of death. I'll read the Escolian back to that sentence. The apostle was an odor of life onto life because by his example, the practice he prepared the faithful to move toward the good fragrance of the virtues or because he was a preacher leading those who obeyed the word of grace from the life of the senses to life in the spirit. But he was an odor of death onto death for those who passed from the death of ignorance to the death of unbelief, giving them a sense of the condemnation that awaits them. 
For again, he is the owner of the life onto life for those who rise up from ascetic practice to contemplation and the odor of death onto death for those who, through the cessation of sin, advance from the death of their members that are upon the earth to the praiseworthy death of their impassioned thoughts and fantasies. The handkerchiefs are the manifest principles of his cognitive contemplation, while the semi-synctia are the honorable modes of practical philosophy concerned with virtue. For they say the semi-synctia are things covering the hands. These principles and modes which permeate and emanate from the body like a fragrance, being the great piety of the blessed apostle became to those who received it the cure for the sickness that was oppressing them. Some of them through the principles of contemplation as if they were handkerchiefs, wiped away the disease of ignorance. Others, through the virtuous modes of ascetic practice completely removed the sickness of vice. Further, it would seem that the dark storm that beset him is the weight of involuntary trials, while the island is the firm and unshakable state of divine hope. The fire is the state of knowledge. The fire of wood is the nature of visible realities, which he gathered by hand, I mean by the intellect's power to grope for things during contemplation, a power that nourishes the state of knowledge by means of the thoughts that arise from it a state that allayed the dejection which the storm of trials inflicted on the mind. The viper is the wicked and deadly power hidden secretly in the nature of sensible things, which bites the hand that is the activity of the intellect as it gropes for things during contemplation, but which does not injure the intellect's clear-sighted vision which with the light of knowledge, as if with fire, immediately burns up the destructive power that had fastened itself to the practical moment of the intellect through its contemplation of sensible realities. There's a scolium halfway through the sentence, which I'll, this last paragraph, which I'll read um, at the start. Whoever, he says, preserves the memory of the saints by imitating their way of life, not only sets aside the deadness of the passions, but also receives the life of the virtues. Back to the text, the last paragraph. I understand what took place in the case of Elijah in the same way. Any person who is dead on account of his trespasses, when placed upon the tomb of the prophet, containing his body, that is, upon the memory, containing a trace of the prophetic life in which the body of the virtues is securely garden, guarded. Such a person, I say, is restored to life by the imitation of the prophet's way of life, being transposed from the deadness of the evil passions to a life of virtue. Thank you, Michael. Um, here, what are the themes here? The themes seem to be wholeness, healing, transformation overall. The overview of, 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 of this little passage is a, the seeming inconsistency regarding saints' bodies. Right. Why respond this way now, that way, another time? It also is about how our tradition considers the event of healing or of miraculous recovery. He distinguishes between nature and grace here. He says that their principles are distinct. 
not to be confused. Our being, our human being, is human nature, our being as nature. But we are also a being of grace. We are grace-filled beings. And how they dance together, our own nature and the grace of God in synergy, renders each person unique. So he's really talking about the uniqueness of, of a holy person here. In um, paragraph 37.4, he talks about permeation and emanation. Permeation and emanation. We know that the principle is noetic, and the mode is aesthetic. Principle refers to noetic, and mode refers to aesthetic. But as one, when incarnated in loving relation or loving response, so principle and mode, or nature and grace, are as one when incarnated in loving relation, loving response. And this idea of permeation and emanation, the principles and modes which permeate and emanate from the body like a fragrance. These aren't metaphors for divine energies, I don't think. They're, they're, they're troublesome if they are, because uh, our tradition doesn't have these as root metaphors. There are root metaphors in other traditions, emanation, permeation. But rather, they're a corrective to, to a kind of slighter way of thinking of thing and act or identity and movement. That is categories of activity and passivity. So grace and nature, permeation and emanation are not to be reduced to activity and passivity. And then a third point, and this is regarding paragraph 37.5 and then scolia number five, which are just, just ecstatically beautiful. Throughout, Maximus is talking about transformation. Here, he says, being as a saint means being of God. We can be as a saint. We might not be saints, but we can be as a saint. If we lay down our passions, he says, in the sweet-smelling tomb with Christ, we are in the tomb with Christ. And if we gather our memories for the sake of our healing and wholeness in Christ, we are with him in beauty. Maximus just hands this to us beautifully. But to close read a little bit, so I just want to look at four phrases from, from uh, it's page 219. It's the end of, of partway through 37.2 into 37.3. So first, just the last paragraph of 37.2, when he talks about, actually the last sentence, for in whatever way he wishes, God, who before the ages determined the limits of each man's life. Okay. So who before the ages determines. The footnote says, does God predetermine, you know, is there that kind of thing? But we know that God encompasses time and its horizon, its horizons of thinking and action, not the other way around. All of our senses of freedom, of response, of necessity, of predetermination, of anticipation, of knowledge beyond, beyond time, all is in the horizon of Christ. And so this, this question is, is nonsense, except for us. And for us, it's a stumbling block. We should set it back down. Then. Thus says, said the Presbyterian. For in whatever way he wishes, God, who before the ages determined the limit of each man's life in the manner most expedient for each. So most expedient for each. In other words, as God comprehends our fullness. Or in the manner of, in the mode of each, most expedient, in the manner, in the mode of each. Expedient means appropriately ordered or fitting in flow. So the gift of life is for each of us. 
And for each means, it is for each. We are lovingly responsive rather than aggressively assertive. Each is responding. Our response, we don't ask another to identify with our response, right? And, and at the beginning of 37.3, if then, you know, it gives an idea, a second line, it would be cause for. So if the principle of nature and grace were both, it would be cause for wonder and astonishment. But that phrase, if blank, it would be cause for blank. What he's saying here is the foundation of a line of thinking is of the highest significance. When we claim things are identified or the same, we have to think about the ramifications of that. The basis on which a thought rests sways all. Or another way of putting this is one's stance is the center of one's being. One's stance is the center of one's being. But one's stance, or stasis, we know in our tradition, Maximus teaches us, is also ecstasis. So it's not foundation and then application. It's stasis, which is also ecstasis. It's stance, which is also unto. Or, to put it in terms we've used lately, one's dwelling becomes one's calling, or is one's form of calling. And then a final little bit. This is six lines up from the bottom of page 219. He says, let us therefore accept that the grace of God, etc. Let us therefore accept the telos of this kind of meditation, this kind of dwelling with, it is not questioning, but discernment. And he says, let us therefore accept that the grace of God works all things through the saints, works all things through the saints, all things. We might not know how to recognize it. We might become distraught or confused, but we need to respond knowing that God is working all things. And then the term, term accept, let us accept let us receive these gifts. Let us integrate their beautiful meaning and begin to correspond. So let us accept here is not kind of blind acquiescence or a removal of, of engagement. It's affirming the, the mode of response or receptiveness or openness and then co-response. Okay, let's move on to the second reading. Um, David Jennings, if I could ask you to please read the whole thing, the question and and the response of Maximus, please, beginning on page 223. So this is question 38. <clears throat> Was it by chance that the Sadducees used the number seven when they spoke of the seven brothers who were married to the one woman? Or is there a deeper meaning? And if there is, who are these seven and who is this one? response. Some people say that the words of blameworthy persons in scripture should not be given an allegorical interpretation. Because, however, it is a greater thing by far to devote oneself to labor and ceaselessly to entreat God to provide wisdom and strength so that we might understand the whole of scripture spiritually, I take courage from your prayers and of you and offer uh, the following concerning this present difficulty. <clears throat> According to the principle of anagogy, the Sadducees are the demons who introduce the idea of chance or evil thoughts. The wife is the nature of human beings. The seven brothers are the laws that, in different times from the beginning of the age, have been given by God to human nature for its education and the generation of the fruits of righteousness. Having intercourse with these laws as if they were men, she bore a son from none of them, and for this reason she was barren of the fruit of righteousness. The first law was given to Adam in paradise. The second law was given to Adam after the fall, in order of punishment. 
The third was given to Noah in the ark. The fourth was the law of circumcision given to Abram. The fifth was also given to Abram when he received Isaac. The sixth was the law of Moses. The seventh law was the grace of prophetic inspiration. For nature had not yet been betrothed to the gospel through faith so that it might live together with a man who would remain with her forever. It is these laws that the demons continually present our outer reason present to our outer reason our I'm sorry let me read that again it is these laws that the demons continually present to our inner reason through the thoughts contending against the faith by subjecting the scriptures to superficial logic posing difficulties such as if there is a resurrection of the dead and we must await another form of life after the present one then of all the laws that have been given through the ages by which one will human nature be governed And if we respond by naming one of the aforementioned laws, they will conclude that human life once again will be futile and unprofitable since it will not be released from its former evils if nature will again be troubled by the very same things. A line of thinking that clearly introduces chance and expels God's providential care of beings. But the Lord and saving word silences those demons as well as those thoughts which he gestures toward the incorruptibility of nature, which, according to the gospel, will be made manifest in the future. And when he shows that human nature, we, uh, that, that human nature will not be governed according to any of the former laws, since it will already have been divinized and united, being betrothed through the spirit to the word himself and God, from whom... And unto whom nature has received and will receive the beginning of its existence as well as its end. If someone should subscribe to the notion that the seven men are the 7,000 years, that is, the 7,000 ages by which human nature have conducted its intercourse, he will have grasped, not without reason or fitting contemplation, the meaning of the passage. For in the future life, Nature will be the wife of none of those ages, inasmuch as temporal nature will have reached its end, and she will have been wedded by the eighth man, who is the age without end or limit. Thank you, David. Now, the themes here seem to be gathering and integrity. What's going on with gathering? integrity overall it's a question of is there a hierarchy of relational significance is there a hierarchy of relational significance it also speaks about apophatic gathering gathering not for its own sake but for the sake of It also is resisting an idolatry of being as, an idolatry of particular incarnation, rather emphasizing the relationship of our being of God. So all these relations, all these things he's talking about, insofar as they are of God. This response also touches allegory and anagogy. Our uh, our editor reminds us that he doesn't use the word allegory very often. Um, allegory means another means. It seems to remove immediate presence. Allegory is not a very common mode in our tradition. Anagogy, which which means literally higher learning or learning lifted upwards, again affirms our being of the divine. So it's anagogical rather, because Maximus is saying, let's see how each of these is of God. The story is not to be disdained in favor of the gift. In other words, we're not rejecting one just for its essence. We're seeing how they connect. And then about intercourse and correspondence. 
intercourse and correspondence. We see here that intercourse does not mean correspondence. Intercourse is the beginning of correspondence, but it doesn't mean correspondence. However, intercourse, like faith, involves patient, intimate groping, to use Maximus's terms, term, feeling carefully what is nearby, feeling its texture, its contours, knowing through closeness, knowing through drawing near. Here further, Maximus is not talking about insistence nor assertion, but relationship. And he explicitly turns down, as it were, the power of chance or necessity. For chance and necessity insist upon themselves and disrupt peaceful relations, either through interruption or by seemingly confining freedom to one, one avenue. He says communion, though, draws us into relation, draws one into relation. I want to look just at paragraph 38.4, just a few lines from 38.4 to close read. First is the last line of, of page 224, just three lines into 38.4, where he says, contending against the faith by subjecting the scriptures to superficial, to superficial logic, by subjecting to superficial logic. Well, we know that faith is intimacy with the divine, and faith means both our being as create creation and our being of God. Superficial logic, a cheapening of the logos, means the logos is reduced to being as and subject to the laws of nature. Superficial logic remo removes our being of the divine which raises us above necessity and chance. And then in a kind of echo from the last question, eight lines down on page 225. He said, just following the, the demonic superficial logic, he says, a line of thinking that clearly introduces chance and expels, etc. A line of thinking that clearly, this reminds us to ask, what is the foundation of our intellectual edifice? What is our stance? And stance means rooted openness. It means both calling and dwelling. Stance means being unto another for the sake of Christ. Line, a line of thinking, line brings along with it rhythm and tonality and implied harmony. So a line gestures towards the integrity of the whole or the dis disintegration of the whole. And then four lines up from the bottom of, of 38.4. So in the middle of page 225, he says, being betrothed, well, go back up. When he shows that human nature will not be governed according to any of the former laws, since it will already have been divinized and united, being betrothed through the Spirit to the Word himself and God, being betrothed, the Holy, uh, rather, human nature here, Maximus says, is betrothed to the Holy Spirit. All else, all clarity, all delights, all communion occurs within this horizon, which is resplendent with simple light and knows only apophatic intimacy and drawing near in love. And the horizon and parameters of this relationship of betrothal is found in Christ's loving invitation, which we all delight in. Let the little ones come unto me. 
let them come. And then just following, just following that line. So being betrothed through the spirit to the word himself and God. And then here, it's amazing. From whom and unto whom nature has received and will receive. Just that. From whom and unto whom nature will receive, has received and will receive. It's fullness. So our reception of the gift is both from God and unto God. It's amazing. It's what we've been trying to say for, for a long time. Our life as co-response. Response forms a central part of our ontology. Perhaps it's apex. It says, from whom and unto whom nature has received. Our whole being is unto God. All of our responsiveness is unto God. It's from God, but it's also unto God. It's astonishing. Let's um let's let's move on to question 39 now, just to keep the initial pace here, and we'll have time to come back to all of these. David Goh, if I could please ask you to read uh, question 39, the whole thing, question and response, and the scholia. Question 39. What are the three days during which the crowds remain with the Lord? in the wilderness, in Matthew 15. What are the three days? Response, <clears throat> the wilderness is the nature of human beings, or this world, in which those who suffer hardships in faith and in the hope of the good things to come, remain with the principle of virtue and knowledge. The three days, according to one mode of contemplation, are the three powers of the soul by means of which they remain close to the divine principle of virtue and knowledge with the one they seek, with the other they yearn, and with the third they strive to receive incorruptible nourishment enriching their intellect with the knowledge of created beings. <clears throat> and a scolia after the three powers. He is speaking of reason, irascibility, and desire. For it is by means of reason that we seek. It is by means of desire that we long for the good that we seek. And it is by means of irascibility that we strive for it. <clears throat> According to another mode of interpretation, the three days signifies the three more universal laws, by which I mean the written law, the natural law, and the spiritual law, which later is the law of grace. And a scolia for these three laws. He calls the power of the soul both days, since they are receptive to the light of the divine commandments, and three more universal laws, since they illuminate the souls that receive them. For just as Genesis called the light day, saying, and God saw that the light was good, and God called the light day, as well as air illuminated by light, saying, and there was evening, and there was morning one day. 
so too did he not only call the powers of the soul days, but also the laws that illuminate them from their full and mutual interpretation creates the composite day of the virtues, which is in no way set, which in no way separates the powers that continually produce it from the divine light of the word. <clears throat> Each one of these laws, in a manner proper to itself, illuminates human nature, because the source of each law's light is the sun of righteousness. For just as it is absolutely impossible for there to be daylight without the sun, neither can the law of righteousness exist without the, without the essential and hypostatic wisdom which makes its own proper light arise in each law and fills the intellective eyes of eyes of soul with intelligible light knowing this the blessed david said your law is a lamp unto my feet and a light on my paths he called the written law, a lamp, because through its various combinations of corporal symbols, riddles, and figures, it skillfully sets fire to and consumes the depravity of the passions among those who, through ascetic practice, undertake against the opposing powers, broaden the steps of their soul's progress And there's a scolia here. Read. The word of God is himself both a lamp and a light, inasmuch as he illumines the thoughts of the faithful that are in accordance with nature, but also burns those that are contrary to nature. He dispels, moreover, the darkness of life according to the senses among those who, through the commandments, hasten to the life that is hoped for. But he punishes by the burning heat of judgment those who by their own inclination to carnal pleasure are attracted to the dark night of this existence. <clears throat> But the spiritual law of grace is called light. For without any artifice and without the use of sensible symbols, it reveals the eternal paths. And a scolia, scolia four. The law, he says, when understood in its symbolic form, is a lamp which through ascetic practice destroys the depravity of the passions. But when it is clearly understood without symbols, it is light through which contemplation, contemplation elevates to divine kinship those who are being led by grace. Making its way along these paths the contemplative intellect is led to the highest summit of good things, which is God. Without the motion of the mind being limited by any created beings. So the light of the law of grace is unwaning. There being no horizon of knowledge able to limit its holy, brilliant beings. Or perhaps the prophet used the word feet to describe the entire course of life according to God, or the movements of good thoughts in the soul, which, like a lamp, guide one with the light of the written law. But paths, by paths, 
He speaks of the modes of virtue in accordance with the natural law and the principles of knowledge in accordance with the spiritual law which are revealed by the presence of God the Word, and which, through virtue and knowledge, lead nature back to itself and to its cause. And there's a scolia. He is saying that anyone who has not first been reintegrated with himself by casting off the passions that are contrary to nature will not be reintegrated with the cause of his being, who is God. With God's grace, this is accomplished by the fresh acquisition of good things beyond nature, because the one who is truly gathered up in God must have a mind separated from created things. Back to the main text, 39.4. Having remained with God the word during these three days, which are three laws, and having readily endured the labors associated with each law, those who desire it, whose desire is turned towards salvation, are not sent away hungry, but receive nourishment which is rich as well as divine. For the written law, they receive the total deliverance from passions contrary to nature. For the natural law, they receive the true activity of things according to nature, an activity through which a relation of mutuality is constituted and which drives out from nature every fragmenting otherness and division. There is a scolia. Six, the function of the written law, he says, is deliverance from the passions. That of the natural law is the equal distribution of goods to all men according to equality of honor. And the fulfillment of the spiritual law is likeness to God as much as this is possible for man. And then the final part of the ambiguous. You have an expanded interpretation of this passage in the ambiguum on the oration on Holy Pentecost by St. Gregory. Thank you, David. That last paragraph is curious, huh? He's saying that this is a way of saying it in response to your question. There's a general way also of, of approaching this, but this is in response. The themes here seem to be grace and, and the gift of intimacy with Christ. As an overview, it asks, what is the symbol of the desert? What is gathered or drawn near or renewed in the desert or the wilderness, as, as it's phrased here. Also, overall, it's about the abundance of our gift of life from Christ. Just a few points before, before looking more closely at 39.4. He speaks early on in 39.2 of, well, he begins in 39.2, according to one mode of contemplation, and then the beginning of 39.3, according to another mode of interpretation. These modes of comprehension, I think mode is the most important thing here. And mode means stance or disposition. It's how we're open to something. It's how we draw near contemplation, 
interpretation, comprehension. But then also in 39.2, he characterizes these kind of modes of contemplation and modes of interpretation in the language of seeking, of yearning, of striving. We want to return to these words a little bit at the end. What does it mean to seek, to yearn, to strive? Now, the response, Maximus's response, is also about dwelling, a dwelling with that calls unto union with our Lord. And dwelling, as we see spelled out here, is not one thing. Its beauties are abundant. It's not one form. Towards the end, too, he gives us image, images of uh, ecstasy in the very last lines of 39.4. So he's, he's giving us images or icons of the ecstatic relation of dwelling and calling. He says that the calling inwardly forms the ecstasy of the dwelling. And also, these, these, these terms, concepts, seeking, yearning, striving, calling, dwelling, they're all in the form of ecstasy. And they're meant to clearly, clearly preclude from the outset temptations of either inertia or identity, stopping movement or stopping drawing near. So yearning, seeking, striving, calling, dwelling, all are different than inertia and identity. All are ecstatic forms. But to turn to 39.4 for a minute, just, just another few yeah. phrases to look at before we open it up. He begins 39.4, having remained, having remained with God the Word, having dwelt in the calling of our Lord, having patiently attended, in peaceful silence, having opened oneself in obedience to the light of the horizon of Christ. That's all there with have room. They, they just stayed with him. I thought of staying, I thought of pausing, but those words kind of seem to suggest cessation of movement. And then he says, having remained with God the word, two lines down, those whose desire is turned toward salvation receive nourishment which is rich as well as divine so rich means not confined to one aspect we don't begin to disdain or condescend to any of these uh, laws as he puts them rather the written the natural and the spiritual pathways of ascesis laws complement each other we disdain nothing, or if we do, it's to our peril. But we live them all apophatically, not for their own sake, but for how each of them is involved in drawing us near to Christ. And then three lines down on, on 228. When he says, from the natural law, they receive the true activity of things according to nature, an activity through which a relation of mutuality is constituted. So at the center of our nature is a relation of mutuality. That's first. It's amazing. Really stark, really beautiful. Second, he says that fragmentation and division are alien visitors to our nature. They don't belong there. Fragmentation is the basis of individuation or individualization or individualism. And division is the basis of doubt. So fragmentation and division are alien to our nature. He says our natural activity is mutual and not delimited to active, passive statement and comments, 
unidirectional assertion and reaction, mutual co-response. And then the last three lines of this. Th from the spiritual law, they receive union with God himself. Through this union, they stand outside of all that has come into being. That's ecstasy. And they receive the glory which transcends nature, through which God alone is known among them, shining forth like lightning. Well, that's a holy sentence, uh, an amazing sentence. It's, well, it's regarding the ecstasies of the saints. The ecstasies of each struggler, each ascetic, each person who stands out, stands forth, and stands unto his neighbor and friend. That's just what being holy means. Standing forth, standing out, and unto the person in front of you. And he says, in this, God alone is known. The alone, I'm not sure what to do with that word, but God alone is known in our brother and sister, not via our abstractions. God alone is known through this ecstasis, through this relationship. And also the language here, through which God alone is known among them, shining forth like lightning. He doesn't use this imagery much. Perhaps he has more than I've noted. But the other time I noted this strongly was in the, the prologue, and this is on page 70. Let's turn back here for a minute, because this simple sentence he is here, he's giving us here on 2 to 8. Through this union, they stand outside of all that has come into being, and they receive the glory that transcends nature, through which God alone is known among them, shining forth like lightning. Well, look at the last sentence, beginning at the bottom of page 70 and over into 71. And we'll just finish up this way. For Logos is the instrument that with consummate skill gathers together, is gathering, the whole manifestation of the divine goodness, which like lightning intellig intelligibly flashes forth in being. Through this manifestation, Logos enters into the magnificently wrought realm of beings and bears to the generative cause of beings to which Logos itself is born. Those who have fully transformed the whole impulse of their innate natural desire, nature, and transformation, no longer held captive by any of the things sequent to the cause. It seems to me that Maximus is speaking in harmony with this passage. This passage sounds almost impersonal because it's written in kind of um, ecstatic, uh, essential language. But he gives us the, 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 the incarnation of it at the end of 39.4. So with these things in mind, let's, let's open it up a little bit. There are three questions we can, we can begin to consider, roughly corresponding with um, Maximus' questions and response. First... This is regarding nature and transformation. So kind of what we're talking about here. What does seeking mean if we understand the gift of life to, to be our created nature and its transformation? Often we think of seeking, yearning, striving as for something which we do not have. But the model is turned, turned on its head here. So what does seeking mean given the paradigm of nature and its transformation. The second, how can we eschew the temptation to make an idol of our method, our work of gathering? How do we strive to make our gathering apophatic? I think often, not often, but because a pathway seems clear or true or to work for us, we assume in our lesser moments that others should adhere to it as we do, just like that. 
we forget the uniqueness of each gift. And we're not talking broadly like anything goes, but I mean in particular response. And then third, how does understanding synergy as correspondence with grace illuminate each of these concepts for us? So how does synergy illuminate grace and illuminate correspondence? And how does correspondence illuminate synergy and grace? And how does grace illuminate correspondence and synergy? Since they seem to dance together in kind of delightful, meaningful intimacy. Ah, let's open it up here, um, taking whatever path we choose. Michael, you muted, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that was... Um... That was the intervention of chance. I, I was in, speaking of chance. I, I was intrigued by the um, introduction of chance in the in um, question in the thirty-eight on two occasions, and um, the the association with it with the um, the demons who introduced the idea of chance and then later it's some um, related to the kind of superficial logic and line of thought that that um line of thinking that introduces chance and thereby expels god's providential care of beings that's um i've been thinking a lot about um, chance because it's one of those um infuriating um concepts that might have a kind of silver lining, but I, I, I'll leave that thought um, aside for now and just focus on the more worrisome aspects of chance. And it it seems to synergy is perhaps a remedy for the um, the evident chance and contingency that is is um, you know by some kind of default in our thinking rife in in our way of our finite fragile way of thinking about things often it's kind of hard to hard not to think about chance and but synergy seems to be i, I don't know this is a little facile um a, a kind of therapeutic contrary or, or a kind of remedy or a kind of ongoing resurrection out of the lines of thinking that are mired in um, an obsession with chance which always threatens to swallow up more um, wholesome thoughts. So that's a kind of convoluted thought, but it's um, but it was suggested to me because um, why raise this um, idea of chance? And it's raised in a purely kind of negative light because it's associated with demons. And synergy, I, if nothing else, it, when we're in a moment of synergy, we... Um, the, Demons are, how, for however brief that instant or period might be, seemingly banished. Anyway, I'll I'll stop there and see if that um, resonates or not with, with anyone. Well, immediately, let me just let me um, respond to that. This chance that is on page two two three, I think I think first of all that's that's beautifully put, Michael, especially the the disorienting interruption of of synergy by chance at the bottom of he says who introduced the idea of chance and then chance and um footnote footnote four it says i.e and he only gives the greek and i'm perhaps because it might be too distracting but automatismos so he's saying chance is that which is self-moving automatic almost right um, that which happens by itself, so to speak. A while ago, we we I think I think several sessions ago, we talked we mentioned that the highest form of of truth for the Greeks was tautology, like the self logos, the logos which is of its own. In other words, self same or self identical truth. Um, this is. The, the auto, the self, means it doesn't need relation. It's not part of relation. So something automatic here. I think they use by chance or that which happens by itself so as to not bring in modern associations. But it's the same 
delimitation of the flow of life as tautology, a truth of its own. And it's the same outside of relations. I really like how you how you brought that. It's it's brilliant. Yeah. It's it's of a different kind of texture and and order than synergy, which is sin together, right? Always. And not only different, it doesn't, it doesn't, it interrupts that. So it's contrary to that. That's nicely put. I just wanted to make that little verbal gloss. Pardon me. I had a fleeting thought as you were talking about it, Michael. And I don't mean for this to lead us astray at all, but um, perhaps in a sense, the what is seen as chance or described as chance or understood as a principle of chance, maybe the opposite of that is spontaneity, that which arises and addresses one which you don't control. <clears throat> well and spontaneity arises from within the relation from within the togetherness it's not yeah that's nicely put there yeah um, that, that, that 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 that's a nicely subtle contrast because chance um uh, as just something unrelated is um is potentially just dis destructive Whereas um, spontaneity can be a value in and of itself, and it can also, you know, because it's a way that we uh, creatively relate to others, it, it also um, can bear fruit potentially beyond, the, you know, what, whatever moment it represents in and of itself. I have a, a kind of, a, it's not so much a question, but I'd, I'd like to hear uh, what you what you have to, to say about it. And it goes back to <clears throat> uh, page 225. <clears throat> and um, it's this image he uses of being betrothed, being betrothed. We have we have we have um, This notion of of the the Theotokos being betrothed to Joseph, <clears throat> we have in the Christian East a service of betrothal. So, what's the? Why isn't this called marriage? It's betrothal, not marriage. Because it hasn't been consummated yet. Yeah. So what what does that what is that suggesting to us? Is it suggesting that <clears throat> this is that this is that dimension of the kingdom of God that we can be present to in this life? Oh my. Um, I, I want to turn it back a little bit on, on each of you. 
David, I like this question. I think it's important. When I when I was reading this and and that word stood out, Vladika Lazar's teach not only his teaching, but I heard it first through him, that the the relationship of Israel to God was one of a spousal relationship rather than uh, legal or something like that or historical spousal. When I read read this word betrothed, I was thinking that it's 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 in the process of the fullness of that of that so so not in the sense of and this is uh looking at huge jennings not in the sense of not consummated yet i mean in some historical instances that's likely sound and, and true with the uh, holy theotokos and so on but it doesn't just mean waiting for something good that's not the model of 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 soteriology we have it's not it's not our model of ontology it's not this is not until when it's at the same time but the fullness is not and you speak about or you asked is it what we are present to or can be present to in this life is there a fullness behind that question too because sometimes you have phrased things in terms of the presence of the kingdom and the fullness of the kingdom. And I'm wondering if that is kind of at the heart of your question too. I think it's really profound. And so I wanna I want to turn it back on, on you and, and, and Jennings too. Well, it does suggest to me that, and I like what David said about consummation because of the way we often think of consummation. Um, as kind of complete. So in that sense, it's it's presence. It's a way of, of, of speaking about presence and attentiveness and being seized. Coming into communion, but it's um, Suggesting that this is <clears throat> this is continuously unfolding, and it would be a mistake to think of it as complete, or to think of it as fullness, as if fullness was done, as if fullness was filling a jar. And his way of speaking about this also, as <clears throat> at the end of two twenty five. <clears throat> If, if I'll, I'll just read it again. If someone should subscribe to the notion that the seven men are 7,000 years, that is the 7,000 ages with which human nature has conducted its intercourse, he will have grasped, not without reason or a fitting contemplation, the meaning of this passage. For in the future life, nature will be the wife of none of those ages inasmuch as temporal nature will have reached its end and she will have been wedded by the eighth man mm. who is the age without end or limit. And this notion of the eighth that we kind of love in orthodoxy and Catholics like it too, I know use it a bit. The eighth day of creation is Sunday. You know, is is the day of ever moving repose, the day of presence, where your making is just made it possible for you to just be present on this day. So <clears throat> we speak of it as the eighth day, and of course we we speak of uh, uh, we can also speak of the culmination of life as he's doing here as being and in that sense the fullness of the kingdom is is the eighth um, epoch 
not even right to call it epoch, I guess, but that is the place of where all of all that was done over the week, including the Jewish notion of Sabbath. Now all of that is bound together in some way that is given by grace. The age without end or limit. So we are still in the position of limits in this life. Well, that's that's enough for me. I was just I was just curious about how we put this as as uh, being betrothed. And there's a certain There's a coming together in that of desire and of commitment, of longing and yearning. Faithfulness. And faithfulness. Pers perseverance, yeah. And moving on, yeah. It's interesting that, you, you know, in light of that, you think of Joseph. Virtually all that we know from the Gospels is a little bit afterwards, but is largely in his betrothal period. He was betrothed to Mary. Yeah. What else do we know? Yeah. Well, do we know anything else? We do know that, uh, you know, when Jesus went to the temple and was lost, that Mary and Joseph at that point that he was no longer in a betrothal period. He was married at that point, whether or not uh, depends on the traditions of whether or not Jesus's brothers uh, is speaking of stepbrothers or otherwise, but uh, there may or may not have been sexual consummation, but at least they were formally married um, by the time of Christ having gone to the temple. But most of what we know of is, uh, a man who is betrothed and wrestling with all the issues around that betrothal. I had, uh, you know, last term in this class on Christianity and literature that I was asked to teach at Newman, uh, we read Auden's for the time being, the last mm. month for Nativity. <clears throat> and one of the students wrote about Joseph. And he's in seminary, and it's St. Joseph's Seminary. So mm -hmm. Joseph's a big figure in his life. But one of the things that, that I found so interesting, if I remember it correctly, is he talked about, about Mary's fiat. Mary saying yes with her whole being to the Annunciation. And he said, and we also have Joseph's fiat. Joseph also whatever the struggles for him was also saying yes. Exactly, yeah. Be this done unto me according to thy will. Whatever it might mean. And in in the iconographic tradition of the East, in, uh, in the nativity icons, we often see Joseph down in the lower corner. And there's... <clears throat> There's often, uh, sometimes he looks dejected, or sometimes he looks like, what the hell happened? Uh, sometimes there's an old man standing beside him, whispering to him. And there are two different traditions of interpretation, which is you know, the nature of iconography, I guess, and all of the iconic part of life. And one tradition says, this is Satan, saying, as Auden puts it in, and for the time being, uh, Joseph, you have heard what Mary said occurred. Is it likely? No. Or the other tradition is 
This is his spiritual father um, giving, listening to him, taking part of his burden upon him, and um, counseling patience and attentiveness and service. Be the servant as she is the servant. You be the mm -hmm. servant to the servant. So, yeah, it's interesting how these work. Is there is there his life story in any hagiography, go in our in our literature? I I haven't. You know, I was thinking of that one <laughs> when you when you asked David, "What else do we know?" And I'm shocked to say that if there is, I've never read it. And uh, I mean, there's a huge one of Mary, but um, <laughs> it's um, and the Proto Evangelium, but yeah. There's certainly something because we we have days where we remember him, so mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. to look at that. God, the things we don't know. I love that uh, the uh, iconographic example you gave. I mean, and that's that's the beauty of an icon where you can show presence. You don't even have to emphasize it, but it's within the horizon of the feast, yeah. and you can show a word being spoken into his ear. I I, uh, I know less than both of you, I, I suspect, about his life. But it strikes me that there should be no, and neither of you did this um, at all, but there should be nothing but, but reverence for, um, like, no disdain, but only reverence. Because as you put it, as both of you put it love beautifully, he, with Mary, was instrumental. You know, Mary is, she's our queen. She's the queen of humanity. She's the center of, of human nature and being, but um, she's not alone. This, but if, maybe we can come at this in another angle too, uh, which will bring us back to Maximus, but also uh, broaden this a little bit. We talked about seeking. And at, well, in the beginning of question 39, Maximus uses words like seek and yearn and uh, strive, yearning, is sometimes um, eros translated into English, but even if it's not, we have these words seeking, yearning, you know, striving, desire. And we're taught though, that the gift of life is whole. We're not lacking anything, it's not finished, but we're not taught to seek something that is not part of the gift of creation. We're not looking for something other than we've been given. And we're not looking for someone other than we've been given. But then this question of betrothal, especially as it's come out here, we're not just seeking the other person either. We're not just seeking them in the flesh, so to speak. We are also seeking our transformation in relation with through, uh, in relation with them, insofar as they're of God. I, I, I one shouldn't even speak this way, but. Mary's yearning, Joseph's yearning, we shouldn't reduce them to, to one thing, and, and nor do we, nor do we. Betrothal, the yearning involved in betrothal or marriage or consummation, or just the yearning for our own transformation, our own healing, is not seeking another thing. It's not even seeking something for ourselves because our transformation, we don't seek for it to happen. It does happen because we want it to happen. So what are we seeking? Are we seeking the fulfillment of the relationship through which we are healed? Are we seeking the, 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 the ongoing, never-ending completing of our being in relation with another person? I mean, because Maximus says, the tradition teaches, this is how we're healed, in relation with another person. He says, the other through whom God alone is known. So what echoes in each of your minds ar around this idea of what are we yearning for? What are we, what's our arrows towards? It's not for our own sake. And really beautifully how you both each just kind of illuminated the Joseph Mary thing. Um, where there's a mutuality, Maximus talks about mutuality. But what about yearning or seeking? 
what echoes in what we've said? What does he mean or what does it meant by a yearning? <laughs> Why don't we sing David uh, Methodist hymn? As pants the heart for cooling stream, well heated in the chase. Yeah. So longs my heart for thee, my God, and thy redeeming grace. It's such a beautiful psalm, and the way in which it's sung by Maddie Pryor in the manner of the 18th century. Yeah, she's great. It's it's this deep contemplation. And I think of that other Wesleyan hymn as well, <clears throat> where it speaks about uh, the word is, and sanctifies to me my deepest distress. Yeah. So I suppose part of that, what that suggests to me is that one of the things that needs healing in us is our fear of our divisions, our fear of our uh, fragmentation, uh, the distress that exists in, in, in most people's lives um, that is vague, maybe not even pinpointed sometimes perhaps, but <clears throat> and so in, in in the words of the psalm and of Wesley's setting of the hymn to have those things which have been fragmenting in your life those things that have given you distress to have them to long for them to be, it's interesting, sanctified. That is for their whole meaning to be changed. So no longer is sin a degradation. It's a knowledge. Because it's been, in a sense, sin is transfigured. It's not just redeemed bought back is transfigured. It becomes made new. And becomes knowledge and insight. Which may be you will have an opportunity to give to somebody else at some point. <clears throat> So I expect the yearning is a multiple layered. You know, it's the yearning of, it wouldn't be called that, but it's more or less the yearning of Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, that kind of primordial uh, longing for the other. Um, it's the yearning that arises when, <clears throat> when uh, we are fragmented. When there's a split that's opened up in us. And it's the yearning for the beloved in the Song of Songs. Going out in the streets at night. It's holy. All of them are holy. And yet Andrew's point about that the yearning is not, or the seeking and the yearning is not for something that is outside of what we have already um, is why our world seeking and yearning is so broken yeah. because it's uh, <laughs> and the cause of so much suffering um, because it, you know, you know, you too, right. But still haven't found what I'm looking for. Yeah. There's that, that cry for that, but you know, 
the heart pants for water when it doesn't have it. Um, and that's what that psalm is trying to get to. So there is that. But why is it that we uh, can't see it, that, that that what we seek? Is it sin that has so clouded us that we don't see we already have it, that we're already participating in it? Um, and that the seeking is seeking for clarity or for a revelation to that which we are in the situation that we are. In the line of the poet, with the surprise delight of discovering what yeah. you did in the beginning. Yeah. So there is a, a yearning there, but it's not for, it's not for something you don't have, but it is for the other. Mm hmm And part of part of what has to happen is that you have to lose your projections, yeah, and your presumptions. In order mm. to say that yes, that Joseph said, Mary's yes and Joseph's yes are, of course, our yes, because it's a revelation about us as well. So differently delivered. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I keep on wondering just how many Marys were there who said no? How many Josephs who let logic drive the decision making and the walked whole, away? The whole of the human family until that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's always been yeah. what I, mean, I bless be he has been offering. Yeah. Well, Andrew, we didn't it? cover nearly anything what you wanted to cover, but it just feels like no, this is no, a great no, no, place no, no. to stop. No, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing wanting to cover. Yeah, we can pause here though, but but yeah. but there's nothing wanting to cover. This is this is really beautiful. Yeah, and this little this little complex that we have just opened up, you two have just opened up beautifully. Yearning is for what we already have, but we know it's for the sake of of God, and it's only through the other. But nothing is disdained in that. There's no Id idolatry of God. There's no idolatry of the others. No, there's no idolatry of ourselves. I think that's what Apophasis teaches us, that it's all gathered up, but the gathering is not to be idolized. The offering is not to be idolized. I, my own my own form of yearning is not, it's being transformed or transfigured, God willing, in synergy. But it's it's not, it's not to be just replicated or identified. Yeah. That's really yeah. nicely put. Well, let's pause here.